<laughs> Do you have any other questions? Yeah, that's good. Today we're uh, looking at um, Haggai. Uh, skipped away from David for a while, so uh, we're having a look at Haggai. One of the things that um, when Lee was looking at stuff for a communion and she um, looked up the pastor Vince Havener from out of the US and um, she was reading a bit about his life and his ministry as a preacher and revivalist and uh, he had a number of sayings and uh, that little things he spoke about and uh, one of them was, um, we get a bottle of medicine and we read it and it says, shake well before use. And he said, God's people are a bit like that. God has to shake them sometime before they're usable. Yeah. And we're looking at a little bit of that today in, in Haggai. Today in Haggai, we're looking at first things first and then God declaring that he's with them. And what's Haggai all about? It's only two chapters, just a little book in the Old Testament. He only preached for three months and he only gave four or five sermons. Um, and then you don't hear from him again. The people, they listened to Haggai and they did change. He did shake them up and uh, before use and they were useful. His ministry wasn't like Noah who preached for a hundred years and no converts. Um, but people listened to Haggai and acted according to his words. Is that mic off or on? Yeah. Which one is it, David? Hello? Hello? All right? Okay, we're back again. Okay, right up. So overlapping uh, Haggai's ministry in the last month was uh, the prophet of Zechariah who preached for two years and then there was Malachi. When you think of somebody preaching only for three months um, and you think of people like Isaiah who spoke for 40 years. Um, but after Malachi, God didn't speak for 400 years until John the Baptist came as a voice crying in the wilderness and uh, calling people to repentance. And no wonder people came out to hear him because God hadn't spoken to them for 400 years, which is a long time. So we need to look at the background story. Um, Ken softened everybody up last week by looking back in history of Israel, so we're going to look at a little bit of history today as well. And songs often have background stories and Julian knows the song and, and uh, you'll remember it too probably. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept and we remember Zion, which was made famous in 1979 by Boney M. And that song comes directly from Psalm 137. When the captives were in Babylon, sitting by the river and remembering what Jerusalem was like. So we're going to have a look at some Bible history. Oops, get the right doofer. History always looks a bit tough, doesn't it? You know, looking back in history. So we're not going to look at Leviticus or anything like that today. So you can rest assured. But we're just going to have a look at it, the timeline of Haggai. And in 605 BC, and BC is before Christ, not before COVID. So, <laughs> 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, he had laid siege to Jerusalem. He had basically starved the population and into surrender. He ransacked the city, burnt it, destroyed the buildings, the city walls, took all the gold and silver, all the goods from the temple, killed many people, and took them many captive back to Babylon. Remember Daniel and his friends were there included in that. He also cut down all the good trees and took the timber back to Babylon and made the area a wasteland. 
So the Jews were in exile for 70 years. Then it came along in 539, Cyrus became the king of Babylon, of, of Persia, conquered Babylon. So he was a kind of benevolent dictator and um, looked after the people better. In 537, he decreed that the Jews could go back to their land as long as they rebuilt the temple. And uh, 50,000 of them decided to go back. Um, the remainder, including Daniel, stayed in Babylon. Why, why did they stay? Well, they'd been there 70 years. Many were born there. They made a life for themselves. Babylon was on the trade route. And Jews are good traders. And so they'd made a life for themselves. Many didn't want to give up the good life. Going back to Jerusalem would mean giving up friends, maybe giving up the house, going back to live in a tent for a while because Jerusalem was a wasteland. So there was a few choices there that we, they sort of had to make. They'd be going from trading to learning to do agriculture again, to plant stuff, to grow stuff. And... Jerusalem hadn't been cultivated for 70 years. Also around Jerusalem, um, there was a lot of people who didn't want them to come back, the locals. So it was going to be more of a spiritual journey than a commercial interest to go back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. In Ezra... Uh, chapter 1 verse 3 it talks about the people coming back to uh, Jerusalem and it says everyone whose heart God had moved prepared to go up to Jerusalem and build the house of the Lord. That was their motivation for going back God had moved their hearts it wasn't a commercial thing Maybe it was a spiritual thing, but God had moved their hearts. And then King Cyrus, as I said, he was benevolent. He gave them uh, 5,500 articles of gold and silver to take back with them, many of which had been taken from Jerusalem when it was ransacked. And they had uh, donkeys, camels, mules, horses, more than 8,000 animals they took back with them. So they were well prepared, financed, for their trip home. Cyrus even gave them an allowance to help them to start build, rebuilding. And uh, they travelled back to Jerusalem. Interesting with how they travelled, where they travelled in the map. If you see here, they travelled from Babylon here. It's the river they cried against. And they went back up over this way here. And then we look at his Abraham when he was called by God from Ur, just below Babylon, and that's the way Abraham travelled. It's pretty much the same route that they travelled back to Jerusalem. I wonder how many of them thought on the travel. If only we hadn't rebelled against God, we wouldn't have to travel the same route that Abraham had travelled. So now, 70 years after captivity, they're retracing the Abraham's journey. So we come back to the timeline and the first thing that they did when they came back uh, was to build an altar to God of Israel and burn a sacrifice, the same as Abraham had done when he went came to places. The first thing he did was build an altar and a sacrifice and thanks to the Lord. And so then they started in 536, they started to rebuild the temple but it was much smaller than the previous Solomon's temple when, uh, before 70 years earlier. And uh, it was a simple design, much smaller. There was not so many of them. There was only 50,000 of the people there. And so they uh, started construction. They paid people from Tyre and Sidon um, to bring cedar from Lebanon, and I'll just go back to that picture there. So they paid people from Tyre and Sidon were up here, and they paid them to go up and get timber from Lebanon, 
and bring it down by boat to the to the Jerusalem, so they could bring it to Jerusalem. That's significant because Solomon, when he built the temple, he got the people from Tyre and Sidon to bring the cedar down to when he built his temple. And he said the Sidonese were the best sawmillers around. So it was interesting that now again they're bringing cedar down from Lebanon. But then the people lost heart and they got tired, became weary in doing good. There was opposition from the locals, as we said, who were, had been living there, which were the Samaritans. There were some Jews who had managed to stay around Jerusalem when it was destroyed. They had intermarried with the locals. And these Samaritans were despised by the Jews as half-breeds or half-caste. And this is why the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told was sort of offensive to the Jews, sort of got up their nose a little bit. The Samaritans were worshipping a little bit of Moses' law and then they were worshipping a lot of pagan idols, so they were sort of half and half and that's why the, the Jews didn't want them around. And so they had these people in Jerusalem who really didn't want them there. So in 534 BC, work on the temple stopped. Two years after they started, they stopped. The foundations were done, they had low walls, and uh, they stopped. And then in 521, um, oops, I'll just go back to here. In 521, uh, Darius became king of Persia, and he got involved in a couple of wars, and like uh, a good... Um, government politician he cuts the budget and the first thing he chopped was the funds that King Cyrus had been paying to Jerusalem for helping with the temple rebuild which wasn't happening anyway so they just had more and more disappointment they said maybe we should have stayed in Babylon maybe we should have got more money maybe we should have brought more people with us to help um, they were really discouraged and then in um, 520 BC, Haggai arrived, and then two months later, Zechariah arrived, and they encouraged the people to build the temple. And finally, in 515 BC, the temple was completed. Which brings us to Haggai chapter 1. And so we're going to read through this today. It says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel. I don't know why they put long names in. The son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, <coughs> The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for yourselves to dwell in, panel, in your panelled houses, and this temple lie in ruins? Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but nobody's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth withheld its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains, on the grain and on the new wine and on the oil. And whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, I should just call him Zed, shouldn't I? 
and the son of Sheatel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of, their, of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zed, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came, and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. We'll look at uh, three main characters in Haggai. Haggai was a prophet, as I said before, he exists only for three months and we don't hear from him again. Doesn't say who his father is. Um, and in those days, knowing who your father was and your lineage was pretty important. And uh, there's nothing about him. And uh, then we don't hear from him after his three months ministry. Interesting thing, he dates his sermons. It says here on the, um, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, in the second year of Darius. So he's dating his sermons, not many prophets did. And then the other person there is uh, Zerubbabel. He was the governor of Judah, appointed by King Darius. And his name means seed, Zerub, seed of Babylon. So he was born in Babylon. His father was Shetil, and his lineage is traced back to the royal line of David, which is an important thing, as we'll see later. It's because um, in the royal line of David, it was a big deal because God had promised David that his family would always be on the throne. And... Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, is in the line of David, so Zerubbabel is in the line of Jesus. We've got a mic problem. Which mic is it? All good? Okay. Getting nervous now. You're back married now, eh? <laughs> and so um, the third character we've got there is uh, Joshua, a high priest. He was a religious leader over the new community in Jerusalem. And of the 50,000 people that came back, um, two out of every 15 were priests. So the Lord had moved a lot of priests to come back. So there were 6,600 plus of the people that came back who were priests. Joshua was older, had been one of the captives in, um, taken from Jerusalem. And so we've got three main people here, Haggai the prophet, Joshua the priest, and Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, who was a politician. So now we've got a priest, a prophet, and a politician, so there should be a joke there somewhere, but I, I don't know one, but uh, interesting. In today's uh, world, in today's social media world, we hear a lot about influences, don't we? We see somebody who's out on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook and they're promoting handbags or clothes. And because I just saw the other day, because some Hollywood celebrity was wearing a pair of um, tracky deck types from a, a company in Logan Home that manufacturing there um, called, I can't remember what it's called, Laxy Kids or something. And uh, now their business is booming. You know, so there's uh, influences. Here we have in Haggai, um, he's bringing the word of God to his two influences, the priest and the politician. The priest, he was, there were 6,000 plus priests, so they're quite a, a big community in the, of the people. And the politician, who was the governor, obviously had the ear of the people. And they, in turn, bring it to the people. I just go back to the last slide here and we see in the verse 1 
It says, The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel and to Joshua. So he was bringing the word of God to the two influences who were then bringing it to the people. This is the message that Haggai delivered. Thus says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And so the people were saying, well, we stopped building, you know, uh, we got tired of doing good, we got discouraged, um, the locals were giving us a hard time, uh, we should have had more resources, more money, more timber workers, maybe uh, we should have stayed in Babylon lo longer. Um, we've not been doing anything in the, on the temple for years, because by now it was about 14 years since they'd stopped work. And our timing was obviously wrong. It was obviously not the right time to, to build God's temple. They were depressed, discouraged. Their high expectations um, of completing the temple had gone. They'd given up after two years. In Ezra uh, chapter 4, 1 to 5, also gives us some insight for their discouragement. It says the enemies, the Samaritans of Judah and Benjamin, came to Zerubbabel and said, we want to help build, rebuild the temple. Sounds good. Their mode, but their motives were evil. And Zerubbabel and Joshua said, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. These were the people who were worshipping other gods as well. So the enemies set out to discourage the Jews and make them afraid. And in Ezra, verse 5, it says, They hired counsellors to work against them to frustrate the purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius of Persia. So they hired counsellors. It was a, bit, a little bit like the Samaritans said, Let's get onto the media, let's get the spin doctors out there, let's put out some false news, some misinformation, accusations against these people rebuilding the temple. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Nothing new under the sun, is there? So way back then, these people hired these counsellors, or as we would say, media, to give them a hard time. In verse 4 it says... Um, God says, is it time for yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses and the temple lie in ruins? He said, well, during 14 years of moaning about the lack of resources for the temple, they built some pretty nice houses for themselves. When he says panelled houses, panelled says nice timbers. Looks really luxurious. Maybe they got the timbers from Lebanon at great cost. As we said before, King uh, Cyrus had paid for timbers to come down from Tyre and Sidon when they were starting the rebuild. And because they hadn't finished, maybe this tim cedar logs were lying around and maybe they said, said well, these are going to get destroyed. The weather's not treating them well. Maybe we could cut them up and use them for our houses. So it was the right stuff for the wrong use. Cedar was special to God. In Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies was cedar-lined. Um, the main hall in Solomon's temple says it was cedar-lined and not a stone was to be seen. And in Psalm 92, verse 12, it says, The, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So cedar reflected God's character. Um, and so not that there was anything wrong with having a nice house, a tidy house or nice gardens. They just had their uh, priorities wrong and their timing wrong. The original purpose of coming back to Jerusalem was to rebuild the temple. And so in verse 5, God says, Consider your ways. Have a think about where you're heading. Um, put first things first. 
Do we come to church to think for the renewing of our minds or the removing of our minds? Uh, there was a pastor who, reiter- who said that often after he gave a sermon, people would greet him at the door on the way out and saying, well, pastor, you gave us something to think about. He says, we come to church to think, not to, um, to not think. And so, uh, as we said, repentance is changing your mind, so we have to think about things to change. And uh, so these people were being asked by God, consider your ways. He said, you've sown much and you bring in little. So their crops were failing. Food prices had gone up. There was inflation because of the lack of food. So price, uh, food was costing more. Um, they earned money, put their money in the wallet, but there was holes in the wallet. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Life, even survival, was hard. And... Uh, they probably said, well, we're glad we stopped building the temple, otherwise we might not have been, not had our houses. So what was the common theme through verse 6? Is the theme is not enough. Isn't that the philosophy today? There's not enough. We can't get enough. So Haggai considers again. The Lord says, consider your ways. Think. Their thinking was wrong. So he encourages them to go up to the mountains to get wood and build the temple that God may be glorified. He says, go up. So the the wood that was there, they'd probably used to panel their houses. Now they've got to go up the mountains and get the wood. And the Lord says, you looked for much, but it came to little. And when you bought it home, I blew it away. Why? Haggai asked the questions. Because the temple is in ruins. Consider your priorities. Put first things first. And then the Lord explains that he, ha- he withheld the dew, their fruits, uh, the rain. They went out and laboured and they had not much to show for it. These were the days when there was nothing to show for their sweat and toil. I think we've all been through those days, haven't we, when there's nothing to show for our sweat and toil. In Matthew 6, 31, it says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so we know to put things first things first. Seek God, seek his righteousness. So then Zerubbabel, Joshua, and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord in the words of Haggai. Um, and they decided to get themselves organised. And Haggai comes and says, this is the Lord's word, I am with you, says the Lord. They got organised. It took them about three weeks to get uh, things planning um, as Mel knows, when you're going to do a building, well, you've got to get things organised. You've got to get the timber and the nails and the blocks of wood and the, and the stones and the stonemasons all organised. And um, It was about three weeks before they got started. But the message that the Lord to the people was, I am with you. Haggai was bringing God's word to them. Haggai was an encourager. He asked people about things, consider, think about it, and here the Lord will be with you. He's an encourager. His questions were for people to consider their ways, 
And as they obeyed and went forward, he encouraged them. So in verse 14, why were the people motivated to start work on the temple again? The Lord stirred up their spirit. Remember when the people were moving from Babylon to Jerusalem, the Lord had spoken to their hearts, warmed their hearts to come. So here's the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the spirit of the people. So it was the Lord roused them up, the Lord awakened them into activity. Unless the Holy Spirit stirs us up, then our motivation is just effort, isn't it? Our effort. So what was God's role? God's role was stirring up. In Philippians 1 it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he, God, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are confident because of our identity in Christ that the work that Christ has done and is doing in our lives will be completed. And they worked on the house of the Lord. Of course, they used effort, blood, sweat and tears, but it was all by God's grace. In Zechariah 4.6, um, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might but by my, or power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So it wasn't by might, by military might or strength, nor by power, which was political intervention. Remember, Zerubbabel was the politician. But it was by God's spirit that they would accomplish the work that God has for them. So how do we live stirred up by God's spirit every day, even on Mondays? There are tough days. By God's word, we're stirred up by reading or listening to God's word day by day. Maybe the work was small. Maybe you're not a block layer. Maybe not a stonemason. Maybe not a surveyor, a carpenter. You might just be mixing cement. Um, maybe just bringing water to quench the workers' thirsts as they work on the temple. But God can use all the giftings that he given to each one of us. In chapter 1, we look at uh, 1 to 11, the people who were depressed. Your house is finished and decorated. My house is, God says, my house is unfinished and in ruins. 12 to 15, the people who became determined, they feared God, they were stirred up by God's spirit. God stirred them up and they obeyed God. And then people who were encouraged, I am with you, declares the Lord. Just jumping across briefly to chapter 2, which we'll look at some other time, but... Um, in chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, um, But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and all of you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord of armies. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Do not fear. So Haggai was an encourager and a commentator on this verse says take courage is not like man up, toughen up or suck it up princess but it's in Hebrew it's passive. It says take, take what is offered, take courage, receive it from the Lord, take what is offered by the Lord, take courage because I am with you do not fear. His gift and pleasure is for us to receive. Receive courage. And so often we need to do that, don't we? To receive courage because we need that promise that the Lord is with us and not to fear. These people in the Old Testament here were under the old covenant of law. 
We're blessed to be under the new covenant of grace. As Ken says, our part is just to believe. Christ is our righteousness. Our identity is in Christ. In Revelation 3 we read, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. We have a true and faithful God, don't we? We are God's temple. We looked at the, the people building God's temple, but we are God's temple. And God is moulding us, each of us, every day. He want what he wants us to be, into the kind of people he wants us to be. We are far from perfect, but uh, like the widow and the oil in Elisha's miracle, the oil representing the Holy Spirit was poured into imperfect jars of clay. And we're thankful that the Holy Spirit lives in us, imperfect as we may be, but showing forth the glory of God. So take courage. The Lord is with you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you are building our, us as your temple day by day. Father, help us to put first things first. Father, we just thank you that you want us to receive courage, to take courage, to know that in all the circumstances that we go through, that you are with us. We just thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.